ओ नम शिवाय ओ नम शिवाय ओ नम शिवाय ओ नमस्ते and welcome to the latest episode on the brahma sutra so last time we ended off with the vedantin quoting a verse from chandogya upanishad about the unbodied self huh when the self has no body then he is not subject to pleasure and pain happiness and distress Let's go back and take a look at the context and see the entire story. Basically, Indra approaches his father Varuna and he asks a series of questions about Brahman. And every time he asks, Varuna says, "Now go off and live another year as a brahmacharya, as a celibate student." a chela and then come back and i give you the answer so after several of these he asks what about the unbodied self the unembodied being what is his qualities what is his nature and varuna replies indra mortal is this body held by death it is the abode of that immortal unbodied self the bodied one is held by pleasure and pain for the bodied being there is no getting rid of pleasure and pain but pleasure and pain do not indeed touch the unembodied being unbodied is air and cloud lightning thunder these are unbodied now as these rising out of that akasha and having reached the highest light appear in their own forms thus does the serene being rising out of this body and having reached the highest light appear in his own form that is the highest person there he moves about laughing playing and rejoicing be it with women or conveyances or relatives not minding the body in which he was born like the horse yoked to the cart so is the spirit attached to the body in other words the attachment is not permanent it can be broken just like the horse can be unhitched from the wagon and go free in the same way the supreme being who is embodied in the empirical self huh as the empirical self the ego the body because ego means identification with body i am the body i am the doer i am the knower of the senses i am the actor the agent the cause of so many things and so on but when one realizes brahman aham brahmasmi i am brahman i mean what else could i be as a conscious being dull matter is insentient it only reflects the consciousness of the absolute so the body by itself is useless what happens when the spirit leaves the body at death it falls down useless get rid of it bury it burn it you know it's <laughs> it becomes nasty but when the soul is present when the atman is present then the body is beautiful it's wonderful it does so many things but that is only due to the presence of brahman now from the brahman's point of view when he drops this body when he leaves this body he becomes unconditioned and at first he finds himself in the brahman with qualities saguna brahman 
or Devi Loka, Shiva Loka. And there he manifests a form of light, a, a mental form or a form of intelligence, of pure consciousness even. And there he sports. He's enjoying. He's having fun. Huh? And there's no lack of resources, no constraints, no limits. He can do whatever he wants for as long as he wants. Because everything is purely mental. <laughs> everything is not dull matter, but simply mental forms which are called into existence temporarily and then allowed to dissipate when they're no longer needed. So this is the self in the subtle world. This is the pure creation, uh, the way it's described in Lakshmi Tantra, that the creation is first made pure, and then the impure creation, in which there are gross bodies and suffering and enjoyment and all that, comes later. So the enjoyment in the subtle form or in the unembodied state is not sense enjoyment. It's direct enjoyment of consciousness. See, this is the Ananda Maya Kosha. This is the bliss body. This is the form of the self when it is not connected with a gross body, but goes off free, just like the horse unhitched from the wagon. So, of course, the opponent doesn't like this idea. <laughs> he is a, a vritikara. He is a maker of duality, of difference. So, uh, of course, he comes up with a repost. Opponent. Unembodiedness, that is, the state of not being identified with the body, can itself be the product of virtuous deeds. Vedantin, not so, for unembodiedness is inherent in the self in accordance with such Vedic texts as having meditated on the self as bodiless in the midst of bodies, as permanent in the midst of the impermanent, and as great and pervasive, the wise man ceases to grieve. Katopanishad 1 to 22. For that Purusha, infinite being, is without vital force, that is, organs of action, and mind, that is, organs of perception. Mundakopanishad 2 1 2. For this infinite being is unattached. Brihararanyakopanishad 4 3. 15. Hence, it is proved that the unembodiedness called liberation is eternal and different from the results of works that have to be performed. So the opponent is wrong to insist that unembodiedness can be the result of work. Unembodiedness or detachment from the body means no more senses no more mind, no more vital force. Hmm? All these things are part of the body. So the body is not complete without the mind. I mean, even lower creatures, animals and so on, have minds. They can remember things. They can think. They can plan. They can act. So it's not that there is no mind uh, in other creatures. Of course there is. There's also consciousness. Because all living beings are nothing but conditioned Brahman. Brahman covered by Upadis. And Upadi means a limiting adjunct. An adjunct is something that's not part of the original being. It's a separate thing. It's an add-on. It's an overlay. It's a superimposition. And in the case of Upadis, this superimposition is a boundary on Brahman. Why are we so concerned with our skin? Huh? 
with the way the skin drapes on the bones, you know, uh, different types of bodies are considered fashionable and unfashionable, attractive or unattractive, according to their structure and so on, and the clarity of the skin and so forth. But this is simply the external shell of the Anamaya Kosha. This is not the being itself. So when one becomes detached from this body, when one becomes unconditioned through enlightenment, then one understands the real nature of the being is consciousness and identifies with unconditioned awareness alone. This is the Anandamaya Kosha, the final stage of the individual, the perfected stage. This is all described in Brahma Sutra in great detail in the third, the end of the third and the beginning of the fourth chapter. So you should read it. There are links below where you can download it. Huh? This is like such an ocean of spiritual wisdom. It answers questions you never even knew you had. <laughs> so let's go on. Among things permanent, some are changefully permanent, with regard to which the idea, that very thing is this one, does not get sublated, even though the thing goes on changing. As, for instance, the earth, according to those who say that the world is permanent, or the three constituents of matter, sattva, rajas, and tamas, according to the sankhyas. But this one is unchangingly permanent in an absolute sense. It is all-pervasive, like space, devoid of all modifications, ever content, partless, and self-effulgent by nature. This is that unbodiedness called liberation, where the idea of the three periods of time does not exist, and virtuous and vicious deeds cease along with their effects, happiness and sorrow, as stated in the Vedic text, speak of that thing which you see as different from virtue and vice, different from cause and effect, and different from the past and the future. Katopanishad 1, 2, 14. And what is that? Brahman, of course. In Brahman, there is no change. Therefore, there is no birth or death, no past or future, no action and result, no cause and effect, no karma. Huh? The modes of material nature are non-existent. Even sun and moon are not there, or lightning, or artificial lights, electricity, and so on. Why? Because everything is self-effulgent, like in a dream. In a dream, everything is illuminated, but there don't seem to be any lights. Huh? It's like everything glows from within with its own inherent light. Well, this is self-illumination. Actually, what it is, is the light of the self illuminating mental objects. When we go into dream, svapna consciousness, if you observe closely, you'll see that it evolves from thinking into thinking that goes automatically, like the narration of a story, someone reading a book or something like that. And it just passes seamlessly from thinking about something, right? When you go to sleep, you should think of pleasant things. Ideally, go into meditation and enter samadhi and go to sleep while you're in samadhi. But for most people, one is thinking and then that passes into a story which is told by the mind. And this is a most amazing thing. If you watch the transition, you can see a glimpse of Turiya. Because it is through Turiya that we are aware of consciousness. Turiya is consciousness of consciousness, 
awareness of awareness. So when you ask someone, are you aware? Are you conscious? And they say yes. Then you can ask them, well, how do you know? And the answer is Turiya. Because aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman. Tattvamasi, you are also Brahman. Therefore, we are both conscious. We are both conscious that we are conscious. And that is the state. That is the proof. The single belief in the existence of Brahman is its only proof because Brahman is completely subjective. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.